everyone happy morning a very good morning i hope and i believe all of you are doing well uh, a quick note whether the audio visual is all good Yes, hello, hello, MD Wiki and everyone here. Could you please give me a quick nod whether the audio visual is all good in the live chat uh, so that we can start. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, here we are discussing the radiology questions that were asked in uh, NEET PG 2023. Quite a few questions uh, were asked, uh, integrated with radiology, uh, right? That's what the trend is going towards. If you ask me overall, how was the uh, exam, the NEET PG 2023, the first reaction definitely was, uh, it was quite easy. We saw a lot of repeats. But when you go into the recall and you try to recall the options, you realize that the questions were a bit tricky with the confusing options as well. So, uh, you know, like it happens in majority of the exam, 50% of the questions will seem like straightforward, easy. And then there were few which were like the tricky ones. So uh, let's just wait for the results uh, because whatever we have marked, the answers are, you know, uh, our scores are not going to change. So let's just wait for the results. And in the meanwhile, uh, you know, we can also start uh, working on uh, INICT preparation as well, right? It's always better to utilize the time that you have, get some break, you deserve it for sure for the next two days or so, and then kickstart the preparation for INICT as well, okay? Ha. Huh. Uh, so let's start. Um, now we are going to do detailed discussion meet of the radiology questions. And even when I was looking into it, even I learned something new when I was uh, preparing for this uh, recall. And especially that question of cephal hematoma, got to learn a new sign that I would be discussing as well. So uh, let's start with the discussion here. And uh, again, let us uh, uh, inform that these questions are recall based. And the purpose of this session is... Uh, uh, is uh, basically also to get the actual questions and more so to learn for the upcoming exams how the trend of the exam is changing and what topics are being asked. So the first one that we had, uh, this question actually could be solved just on the basis of the uh, CT finding periventricular calcification. So 31 year old female delivered a 1 kg baby and there was hepatosplenomegaly, jaundice. On CT there was periventricular calcification. So that itself is the main clue to help you diagnose a CMV infection. Periventricular calcification is CMV. Right. How do we remember that? When I write CMV, the V is the ventricular part. Right. Remember V for ventricular. So CMV has periventricular calcification. Why in toxoplasmosis, where do we have the calcification? How? Uh, where would you see the calcification in toxoplasmosis? Congenital uh, toxoplasmosis is what we are talking about, not the opportunistic one in the HIV positive patient. So remember T for T, toxoplasmosis is the calcification throughout. Okay, it is diffuse calcification. CMV is periventricular calcification. Any other congenital infection can you think about when you see the calcification in the CT? Like cortical calcification, microcephaly, if that is given, which congenital infection would you think about? So we are also going to discuss, you know, the potential questions for the other exams like the upcoming INICT exam or the next exam as well. Which other congenital infection do you think also shows the calcification in the brain in CT and has microcephaly associated with it? That's the Zika virus. Okay, remember also Zika virus can show the calcification along with the features of microcephaly. A lot of cortical malformations is what we might see. Zika virus uh, was asked in the previous INICT exam as well. Can you tell me the vector for Zika virus? You know, um, for students who have been watching my sessions, you know that I have this habit of jumping from, uh, um, you know, everything about a topic from one subject to other subject and integrating basically. That's the need of the R. Very good, Subhash. So, Zika virus is ADs, right? That was our mnemonic ADs when I write. I write it like this. To remember that the Z stands for the Zika. Okay, the Z stands for Zika. And also Zika virus, uh, if they're in the mother during pregnancy, it affects the cells uh, in the placenta. 
right and it gets transmitted to the baby parvovirus b19 what do we see with parvovirus b19 very very important in the antenatal ultrasound fetus may agar parvovirus b19 transmit ho raha hai so what do you see in the antenatal ultrasound what do you see right absolutely uh, the fetus has anemia and it leads to hydrops fetalis okay it has anemia and hydrops fetalis this is a non immune hydrops fetalis so these are the findings that you would see in parvovirus b19 in the antenatal ultrasound and another potential question for your upcoming exam for um, anemia fetal anemia how do you test for fetal anemia in doppler obstetric doppler mein aap kya dekhte ho basically to uh, look for anemia in the fetus the severity of anemia in the fetus that's a previously asked question as well it is middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocity which should be more than 1.5 uh, multiples of median right more than 1.5 mom multiples of median mca peak systolic velocity increases in fetal anemia a very very important question okay that's a very very important question all right let's go to the uh, discussion of the next question another one related to the infection and again the ct finding was very very important there ct reveals the bi temporal hemorrhage or the question said that on ct scan the temporal lobe is affected what is the diagnosis whenever you have temporal lobe affected we always have to think about hsv encephalitis right it has an affinity for temporal lobe we had discussed it so many times uh, uh, in our sessions right hsv is temporal lobe very very important and what hsv is this affecting the brain it is hsv1 okay so it is hsv1 above the waist hsv1 below the waist genital herpes is hsv2 right so this is going to be hsv1 okay that's going to be hsv1 uh, honestly there were two questions on hsv uh, encephalitis in the exam a question mein to itself it was mentioned ki temporal lobe mein hai and the diagnosis is hsv encephalitis so if you remember that question in the exam hall you could definitely answer this question from that question itself so probably multiple set of uh, examiners putting the questions they didn't know ki ek examiner ne already answer bata diya hai ki temporal lobe wala encephalitis is hsv right so that's what i said there were two questions one was this one and another one was where already it was given in the question ki herpes simplex encephalitis hai what is the most accurate or what is the best investigation for testing right the csf for dna pcr i believe that should be the answer there do your uh, microbiology faculty would be a better person there to comment on that one theek okay? hai so two questions on hsv next one i believe now this is the favorite with the examiners and we had discussed this in our uh, uh, the neat pg marathon as well so this is the same question a repeat question from neat pg 21 sterile pyuria ka history in a 35 year old female and it is uh, going to be sterile pyuria tells me it's tb and tb is putty kidney and this is a putty kidney that we are seeing here the calcified kidney the parenchymal calcification is what we see with that lobulated appearance this is a putty kidney okay this is a putty kidney right so putty kidney basically the kidney becomes non functioning okay the kidney becomes a non functioning and it is called as autonephrectomy so in which condition do we see autonephrectomy it is tb in which condition uh, in which condition do we see autosplenectomy in which condition do we see autosplenectomy so again reinforcing this is not just a recall it's also learning the important uh, related points that are asked and are uh, frequently in the exam autosplenectomy is seen with sickle cell anemia okay that is um, uh, that is sickle cell anemia what are the other findings with urinary tract tb urinary tract tb what are the other findings what happens to the ureter the ureter has the beaded appearance because of the multiple strictures tb everywhere causes strictures so ureter has the beaded appearance or it is also called as corkscrew appearance what happens with the bladder the bladder is called as thimble bladder remember tb has thimble bladder that is a small contracted bladder again because of fibrosis on cystoscopy we also see the golf hole ureter appearance the opening of the ureter is like a golf hole okay so that's the golf hole ureter 
And why this is not Staghorn calculus? Anyone, why this is not Staghorn calculus? This is not a Staghorn calculus because even in Staghorn calculus, it would be a plain X-ray, but it would take the shape of the pelvic calicial system, right? Like the horns, it will have those, it will take the shape of the PCS, okay? So that is what we need to know. Calcified psoas abscess would be in this position, paravertebral position. This is where you would see the calcified psoas abscess, okay? And nephrocalcinosis, we have seen especially the medullary one. You will see those triangular appearances in nephrocalcinosis, okay? The medullary nephrocalcinosis. Let's go on to the next one now. A 22-year-old female presented with swelling in the forearm and the radiograph was given, both the AP and the lateral view. And what is the diagnosis? Uh, just focus on this image here. This is post-treatment here. Just let's focus on the first image here. Right. Now, the confuser here was, first, the age given was 22 year old. So, we think that giant cell tumor, 30 to 40 may aega, to 22 may nahi aega. It's not like that. In the wrist, remember when the suffusion gets complete at the wrist joint, it is around 19 years. 18 to 19 years, the fusion gets completed. So, GCT versus chondroblastoma versus aneurysmal bone stitch. Uh, a quick, uh, uh, yes, uh, a quick revision of that. So, GCT, chondroblastoma and ABC. What are the differentiating points here? Giant cell tumor occurs in a giant person. What is a giant person? Basically, an adult person. That means it's a fused skeleton. Okay, it's a fused skeleton. Does it affect the epiphysis or the metaphysis? So, remember ECG. That means epiphysis ko affect karne wala is chondroblastoma and the GCT. So, this is going to be epiphysis. This is going to be epiphysis. What is the difference between chondroblastoma and GCT? Chondroblastoma. Blastoma, we speak about generally in children. So, this is unfused skeleton epiphysis. Opposite of GCT, fused epiphysis ka opposite is ABC. That means it is unfused and it is metaphysis involvement. That is ABC. This is a 22 year old, the bone is fused, it's not an unfused bone. So this is not aneurysmal bone cyst, unfused nahi hai, chondroblastoma nahi hai. This is not like an outgrowth from the bone, to call it osteochondroma is basically an exhaust osteo. So this is also out. So the answer here is giant cell tumor involving the epiphysis, the end of the bone, right? And it is expansile. It had that soap bubble appearance. Also, the image showed the soap bubble appearance as well, which can be seen in ABC as well. So, the most important point here was basically the growth plate is fused. It's a fused skeleton, mature skeleton. So, it is GCT. It's involving the epiphysis. The end of the bone is involved. So, this is giant cell tumor. Again, a favorite with the examiner, all-time favorite. And another question that they ask here, what is the treatment of GCT? Previous neat PG question, it is curettage. Extended curettage, it is not chemo radiotherapy, it is extended curettage. Okay. Going on to the next one. Again, this is a repeat from neat PG21. Again, a lot of questions I could see were repeats from uh, neat PG21. Not just radiology, but uh, other subjects as well. Uh, so, 35 year old patient with morning stiffness, reduced chest expansion, also red eye was given. So all this given along with this image, even without the image, you could make a diagnosis that it is ankylosing spondylitis because what does morning stiffness indicate in any patient? Morning stiffness in any patient basically indicates it is inflammatory arthritis. That is how we differentiate clinically inflammatory from degenerative. What happens in degenerative arthritis? Because the joint is worn and torn. It is with activity that the pain increases. In inflammation, it's opposite. With activity, the pain decreases. So that is why there is morning stiffness. The patient not doing any activity at night, sleeping, that increases the pain. So that is uh, that is inflammatory arthritis. Red eye ka significance here meet is it is uveitis, right? Most common extra articular manifestation uh, with uh, ankylosing spondylitis is anterior uveitis. Okay, so that is why uh, that the uveitis is the red eye. So, what do we see in the radiograph here? Uh, basically, we are seeing this bamboo spine. The fusion of the vertebra is what we are seeing here. 
The image also showed the dagger sign which is not seen here. There can be fusion of the sacroiliac joint which can be seen, right? So ankylosing spondylitis, it starts with sacroiliitis. What HLA testing do we do? It is HLA B27, it starts with sacroiliitis and then it goes up involving the entire spine. Quickly tell me the important appearances that we see. Right, what appearances do we see? One is the bamboo spine. Then is the first one is the Romanus lesion, the shiny corner sign. Then we have the Anderson's lesion, the spondylodiscitis that occurs. Right, there is squaring of the vertebra that we see. Squaring of the vertebra. Then we have the dagger sign, the white line in the center, ossification of ligament. And we have the trolley track or the tram track sign. These are the various signs uh, that we see in uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Okay, so this was ankylosing spondylitis. Straightforward question. Next one. Again, uh, uh, if we look at the prediction and the trend that is changing, you would see at least one question here which is related to radio sensitivity and radio resistance. There was a question in NEET PG 21 also where they talked about a patient of leukemia, uh, uh, bone marrow, stem cell transplant, karna, undergoing air radiation. The least affected would be the neurons. That was a question asked. FMG may then there was question on most radio sensitive tumor. So a lot of question we are seeing at least one question on radio sensitivity and radio resistance. Similar question here. Which of the following statement is true regarding ionizing radiation? Pele ka history was just there to waste your time. So the normal cells and the cancer cells will be equally sensitive? No. Right, if, if they were equally sensitive, then we would have not used radiotherapy. That means it is killing the normal cells as well. Because the cancer cells will zada effect hoga, that is why we use radiotherapy. Though there would be some damage to the normal cells as well. But the cancer cells are more sensitive as compared to the normal cell. Because the law of Bergoni says that the cells which are actively dividing, more dividing cells are more sensitive. Cancer cells are more dividing, so they are more sensitive. GI mucosa is most resistant part? No, a sort of repeat from NEET PG-21. The intestinal mucosa is the dividing, so it is sensitive. It is not resistant. The radiation at a point is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source. Absolutely right, this is correct. And this is something we have discussed. It is called as inverse square law. Okay, the distance follows the inverse square law. What does that mean? If this is the radiation source, okay, this is the radiation source, one person here, another person here, this person A is at a distance of 1 meters, person B is at a distance of 2 meters from the radiation source and I ask you, the radiation received by this person B as compared to person A would be how much? What would be the answer to that? Will it be 2x? Will it be 4x? Will it be half? Will it be 1 fourth? The question is the radiation received by person B as compared to person A would be how much? Correct. Absolutely right. You can rule out the options of 2x and 4x because jo jitna dur hai, as you go away from a radiation source, logically thinking the radiation received will decrease. Right. Okay. So here the distance is 2x, 1 meter and 2 meter. The distance we are doubling. So, the radiation will be less. So, either will it, it will be half or it will be one fourth. Now, it is the inverse square law. Distance double kia, lekin jo radiation received hai, wo 1 upon 2 ka square hoga. That means it will be 1 by 4. Okay, because we have 2x the distance. Now, if I ask you that this person is at a distance of 3 meters, humne 3x kar diya aga distance, the radiation received would be 1 by 9, 3 square. If we do the distance 4x, then it would be 1 by 16. 5x, it would be 1 by 25. That is what is inverse square law. Okay, remember distance follows the inverse square law. So this was definitely the correct statement. So automatically the rest are incorrect. Small blood vessels are resistant to the effect of radiation. No, okay, they are not resistant. And we, we uh, employ this advantage that small blood vessels are sensitive to radiation when we give fractionated radiotherapy as well, right? So, this is the answer to this question. Going on to next one, again, the clinical history was good, good enough to help you answer the question. And even without uh, looking at the image, you could answer this question. And the question is 51-year-old man with a history of smoking, pain in the right arm. There was ptosis, there was honors, right? So, all this 
with the chest radiograph showing you something in the lung apex and all these features uh, definitely goes towards the diagnosis of pan coast tumor okay definitely it goes towards the diagnosis of pan coast tumor upper lobe pneumonia will have the history of fever and creps aspergillosis has a background history of asthma cystic fibrosis SVC obstruction, the drainage not happening. There would be a lot of swelling in the upper half of the body. All that is not given here. So based on the clinical history, you can say that this is pan coast tumor. Okay, this is pan coast tumor, which is basically the superior sulcus tumor, right in the lung apex. And can someone tell me what is the investigation of choice for pan coast tumor? What is the investigation of choice for pan coast tumor? Very good. Remember, this is the lung cancer where MRI is the investigation of choice because we want to look for brachial plexus invasion. We want to look for brachial plexus invasion that leads to the pain in the arm, right? Uh, the sympathetic trunk involved leading to horners. So that is why MRI. Rest of the lung cancers, it is CECT, which is the investigation of choice. Correct. So this is going to be MRI. Horners was not mentioned. Okay. So I'll remove horners there. Okay. Going on to the next one. Again, this is a repeat from the previous NEET PG exams. This is another favorite with the examiners. Uh, and classically, the radiograph showing the steeple sign. Though the image, I would say, was not very, very clear. But from the options, uh, right, and from the history, we could see that it is laryngotracheobronchitis. Because logically thinking, if it was epiglottitis, what sign do you see in epiglottitis? It is the thumb sign that is the inflamed epiglottis appears thickened, right? And what x ray view is there? What x ray view was there in the epiglottitis? It is going to be lateral x ray view. Where do you see the thumb sign in the lateral x ray view, right? Laryngotracheobronchitis is going to be the frontal view, and that is where you see the steeple sign because of the inflammation. Uh, you know, there's the narrowing of the airways and that gives that pointed appearance. That is the steeple sign. Okay, that's a steeple sign. Laryngomalacia, you would not see on a x-ray. Okay, so that is why this is the steeple sign LTB. Going on to the next one. I see a lot of confusion among students related to this question here. Thirty-six year old patient with cough and fever. There are creps and the x-ray is done. What is the diagnosis? So two options said it was lower lobe consolidation. One option said it's middle lobe consolidation. And one said it is pleural effusion. It's a loculated pleural effusion. Right. Now the answer here is middle lobe consolidation. Why? Because the image which was similar to this image. This is where we saw an opacity. And it was obscuring the right heart border. So basically this was an applied question of the Silhouette sign. We have seen such questions in the previous FMGE exam as well. So that is why time and again, I would say that for NEET PG exam, do the FMG previous year papers as well. So when you have an opacity, which is obscuring or silhouting the right heart border, it is going to be the middle lobe consolidation. If it was a loculated pleural effusion in the right horizontal fissure, Classically, the shape of that loculated pleural effusion, if it is here in this location, it will have that biconvex shape or the lentiform shape, right? We have, we have spoken about that in the heart failure. It is called as the phantom tumor, the vanishing tumor. It classically has the biconvex shape, right? So this is middle lobe consolidation. This is middle lobe consolidation because it's obscuring the right heart border. You can see that the diaphragm is seen very well. It is not obscuring the diaphragm boundary. That is why this is not the lower lobe. If it was lower lobe, then it would obscure the diaphragm as well. Okay. So this is middle lobe pneumonia. Going on to the next one. This was actually tricky. Right. At the, at the first look, uh, if you see, uh, this looks like a EDH. Right. It looks like the biconvex shape of the EDH. Right. But if you deep dive into the history, and the further appearance, uh, the answer there comes out to be SDH. Why SDH? Why not EDH? First of all, uh, the history is uh, basically a chronic history and a trivial fall. It's not a significant injury for EDH to happen. 
EDH is because of the middle meningeal artery rupture. For arterial rupture, there has to be significant fracture associated. And for fracture, the trauma has to be significant. Here, it was just, uh, you know, alcoholic patient falling, a trivial history that was given. Right. So, that goes, the history goes more in favor of SDH. Second, uh, uh, if, if you look at this image here, the CT here, here we have the site of the suture. Right, which is not seen here because this is not the bone window of the CD. If it was a bone window, we would have seen the suture very well. So this is the site of the suture and the hemorrhage is crossing the suture line and that is why it is SDH. Okay, so that is why this is SDH because it is crossing, crossing the suture. Okay, it's crossing the suture. So yes, I'm, I'm sure that uh, many have uh, made a mistake in this because at the first look, it definitely looks like an EDH. Right, so the answer here is SDH because it is crossing the suture line. Okay, because it is crossing the suture line. So like this questions, there were many other questions which were tricky, right? So uh, do not go into like the recalls uh, uh, just to assess your score, but more so to learn out of it like you are doing in this session. Okay, going on to this one. I would say this was an easy one. The options were easy for this image here. The image itself was a spotter. And I think there was a history of farmer given here. This was a 50-year-old farmer who presented with abdominal pain. And only one option uh, correct here, which is you can see this membrane floating. Like we see the water lily sign on ultrasound. Right. So that is basically the etiology is echinococcus. That is correct. Echinococcus, hydatid cyst is caused by echinococcus. So that is going to be the correct answer there. Okay, that is going to be the correct answer there. Uh, automatically, learning point here, when you know in a particular question that this is the correct answer, I know that this is a true statement. Automatically, I rule out the rest. I don't overthink on that question and I don't waste my time on that, right? So when you're pretty sure that this answer is correct, hai, don't get confused and don't go into like, you know, thinking about the other options. So this is hydatid cyst. Okay, this is hydatid cyst in the liver with you can see the membranes floating inside okay going on to next one another question which has a lot of buzz going around uh, the trauma ka history with the frontal sinus expanding 30 year old female presented with non-axial proptosis of the left eye there's a history of trauma there is a homogeneous lesion in the left frontal sinus as given below what is the diagnosis Though this is not the exact image, but this is the closest uh, image that I could get. And the answer here, answer here is frontal mucosal. When they are telling you that it's a lesion in the left frontal sinus. Frontal sinus mein konsa lesion jayega isme se? That's going to be the frontal mucosal. Not the frontal meningioma. If it was meningioma, it is not within the frontal sinus, right? It rules that out. Orbital pseudotumor. Pseudotumor causes the muscle enlargement, right? In including the tendon, the belly, the ten, the belly and the tendon both are included versus thyroid ophthalmopathy where the tendon is spared. Yahape, this was outside the orbit, right? So this is the frontal sinus ka bony margin, which has the frontal sinus was not black. It was not containing air, it was expanded. The orbit was separate, right? So that was not orbital pseudotumor. And of course, it was not the JNA. JNA ka site frontal sinus mein nahi aega, right? So that was not even JNA. So uh, remember, this is a frontal mucosal. Definitely in mucosal, the history can be chronic. Initially, the small mucosal, they can be asymptomatic when they cause a lot of expansion of the sinus. Then they cause the mass effect and that's when the patient can present. Otherwise, mucosal can go uh, unrecognized as well. Okay. Right. So the major clue there was even the history itself is sufficient to Vijay Raghavan there. Hai na? He, sinus ko kya expand karega out of all of these? It's going to be the frontal mucosy. Pseudotumor involves the muscles. The muscle enlargement is what will be there. Yes. Going on to the next one. Another question which could be solved based on the radiological finding. Chest x-ray shows the mediastinal widening. Whenever you see a patient of acute chest pain with mediastinal widening, whenever you have a combination of these two, acute chest pain with mediastinal widening 
always 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 think of aortic dissection always think of aortic dissection okay so uh, the rest of the history here the chest pain was radiating to the neck and the interscapular region blood pressure unequal blood pressure in the right and the left upper limb because the dissection involving one upper limb ka artery can cause a decreased blood pressure there so this is going to be acute aortic dissection for sure again i would say this is sort of neat pg 21 repeat a lot of questions were repeat from neat pg 21 i believe and there the uh, question asked was ki what is the investigation that will help you confirm the diagnosis so let's just quickly discuss the investigation of choice if it is a stable patient right if it's a stable patient aortic dissection patient can come to ct scan we can do ct angio if it's a unstable patient right if it's a unstable patient in uh, that case the patient cannot come we need to do something bedside ultrasound that is trans esophageal echocardiography so it depends on the hemodynamic parameters the blood pressure less than 90 more than 90 right so this was aortic dissection okay mediastinal widening is the major clue there uh, next one now abdullah i think the cp angle was clear there it was obscuring the right heart border it was uh, it was uh, basically uh, middle lobe pneumonia next one again a repeat question and uh, the history again you can see that a lot of image based questions the history is a major clincher there right so history sometimes can help you answer the image based questions even without recognizing the image infertility ka patient now on treatment the patient was on treatment receiving hmg injection all of that was given that itself tells you it is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome right now uh what are we seeing here the, we have seen this image right in the neat pg marathon discussion that we had so you have one ovary the second ovary a lot of large large follicles in both of the ovaries these are not the small follicles all of them are large follicles that tells you that the ovaries are very much stimulated there is no increase in central stroma which is seen in pcos right so this is a case of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome if it was pcos it would be the bulky ovary with the small small follicles in the periphery giving the necklace sign or the string of pearl sign the central stroma is increased and echogenic because of the androgens theca lutein cyst can look very similar to ohss because theca lutein cyst is seen in association with molar pregnancy so in that case the history given would be beta hcg positive so maybe uh, the next time they can give you that uh, this is uh, going to be uh, like you know the patient is beta hcg positive the image can be same and then the answer would become theca lutein cyst because of the increased progesterone levels uh, right a lot of beta hcg high hcg uh, the ovaries are stimulated and again it would look similar to the ohss for theca lutein cyst remember majority of the times there is spontaneous resolution and uh, once you do the suction evacuation for molar pregnancy the theca lutein cyst also uh, involute because there's no beta hcg now right so that is what the history is going to be esophageal rupture a uh, retro buzz uh, if you are asking about this see esophageal rupture ke liye, there should be some history uh, like similar to bore halves some foreign body leading to perforation of the esophagus and in that esophageal rupture may the air goes out and that leads to pneumomediastinum there would be pneumomediastinum which can lead to subcutaneous emphysema as well so right like inict mein diya gaya tha haman's crunch can be present what sign was asked in one of the recent exam the jinko leaf sign because in the pectoralis muscles the air going in between the fibers that gives the jinko leaf sign so none of there was that that was mentioned so this is not esophageal rupture and why will esophageal rupture cause the unequal blood pressure in the two arms unequal blood pressure in the two arms a vascular pathology not the esophageal pathology okay hmm. isle never jump to the answers uh, by just uh, looking at the image the clinical history is very very important that is why we say that radiology is not just like photography images they and diagnosis it has to be in the background of the clinical history okay and uh, next one now this was quite tricky and uh, many of you said that the image itself mentioned there was written on the image that it is a bipartite patella was already mentioned 
so that was a major clue from the examiner there uh, just that uh, you had to be a bit keen on identifying that it was already written there and uh, so if uh, already image pe likha hai, so bipartite so i don't think there's any point in discussing that so we will go with the rest of the three options were fracture related to fracture hai na? so uh, this is going to be bipartite patella generally it is what is bipartite patella when there's a problem with the fusion of the patella and the classical site for a bipartite patella would be uh, this superolateral position. It would be a small fragment that you would see. So if this is the patella on the superolateral aspect, this part of the patella does not fuse with the rest. So that is what is uh, bipartite. And uh, you know, what do we have is uh, you will, you will uh, do the radiograph of the other knee because it's a congenital sort of pathology. So we need to see whether there is going to be uh, the bipartite in another knee as well. Generally, it's bilateral. And there was no definitive history of trauma as well, which was given. So no history of trauma against going in against, uh, uh, against uh, the fracture. So don't know what the examiners decide on this. You might get like the last knee PG exam. We had two questions where all the candidates were given the marks for that. Uh, so there might come up such questions uh, which will uh, tell you that it's come marks up they do. So uh, if they realize this, maybe they can give marks to everybody. Okay, going on to next one. Again, uh, just the history of a patient developing mesothelioma, construction worker, cement factory mein kaam karne wala, cough hai, shortness of breath hai, and he developed mesothelioma. So mesothelioma definitely is going to be asbestosis. Time and again we read this. Mesothelioma, specific tumor associated with asbestosis. But the most common is the bronchogenic carcinoma. Right. And what are the other radiological signs? Uh, the very, very important in asbestosis is calcified pleural plaques, which involves the parietal pleura or the visceral pleura. That is the parietal pleura involvement. Okay. Another on the CT chest, we might see the comet tail sign. On the CT chest, we might see the comet tail sign. This has been asked in the previous All India PG exam. So important. So comet tail sign that is seen because of round atelectasis. So what happens is adjacent to the pleural thickening, there is a round atelectasis, a round area of collapse, pulling the vessels towards itself. And those pulled vessels, they give the comet tail sign. Okay, they give the comet tail sign. Yes, one of the option was silicosis as well. But because it was mesothelioma, it has to be asbestosis. Mesothelioma is asbestosis. Okay. Next one. Now, coming to some uh, extra images that I could recollect were asked in the exam. So, this was one thing which was given uh, a patient uh, with this uh, bone deformity. And uh, other thing that was mentioned in the question was skin lesions were also there okay there were skin lesions as well so this is going to be the diagnosis of fibrous dysplasia what are we seeing here the femur which is bent like this it was shown on the left side this i have taken the right side that is shepherd crook deformity okay so if you go back to my youtube channel as well i've put a video long back just short short one minute videos of radiology they really help you a lot uh, Shefford crook deformity is something that I've discussed there with the image. So Shefford crook deformity of the femur is seen in fibrous dysplasia. It gives that ground glass matrix, the ground glass appearance of the bone, right? And the skin lesions, what do the skin lesions indicate? What do the skin lesions indicate? Three look, non-ossifying fibroma. Is that one particular it comes under do not touch lesion because it has a characteristic appearance. Most common sight, you would see that in the tibia, it looks similar to adamantinoma. It has that lobulated appearance, cortical based tumor. Uh, NOF is a cortical based tumor with the lobulated margins. This is entire bone affected plus the skin lesions, which basically represent the caffiole, uh, right? Uh, like you see in McCune Albright syndrome which has a polyostotic fibrous dysplasia with the caffiole spots and precocious puberty, right? So this is uh, going to be fibrous dysplasia. The shepherd crook deformity of the femur is fibrous dysplasia. Remember that, okay? 
Uh, next image, this was basically radiology, anatomy, ortho, integrated, everything integrated. The question was fracture at which of the following sites uh, will cause uh, uh, the inability of dorsiflexion, right? Which of these will cause the inability of dorsiflexion? So if you remember from our mnemonics, we discussed the uh, PED tip is the mnemonic, right? PED tip is the mnemonic for the function of the peroneal nerve and the tibial nerve. So what does the peroneal nerve does? Peroneal nerve is responsible for eversion and dorsiflexion. Tibial nerve is responsible for inversion and plantar flexion. So when they say ki dorsiflexion is gone, that means peroneal nerve is gone. Peroneal nerve is the fibular nerve, the lateral nerve. So it has to be the fracture somewhere related to fibula. Now there were four arrows there, ek femur pe, ek tibia pe, or do fibula pe. There were two arrows at the fibula. So these two options are definitely out. Fibula ke neck ke around is where we have the common peroneal nerve. So the lower arrow was the one which is going to be the answer. It is going to be the fracture of the fibula neck which causes the foot drop. That means the inability to cause uh, the, the inability to cause basically dorsiflexion. So remember that is what was it was the lower arrow which was there. Don't remember the option exactly. Maybe C like you are saying. So that is what the answer is going to be there in that case. So a lot of questions we have seen also being as integrated with radio anatomy and orthopedics, right? So we need to be very good with radio anatomy as well. Okay, uh, the next question here, uh, a sort of similar image, but though the lesion was, uh, uh, the lesion was much more larger, right? And the history given was two months say have a swelling in the skull present since birth. So two months basically means it's very chronic. If it was caput or, or if it was subgaleal hematoma as well, they generally resolve uh, very fast. They cross the sutures, they cross the midline, right? This was on one side itself. The lesion was much larger and it had that calcification also, right? So there is this terminology which is called as calcified cephalohematoma. If the cephalohematoma is uh, not regressing, it can get calcified. That is called as calcified cephalohematoma. And the sign that has been described, that is called as the uh, double skull sign. Okay, that is because of the double skull sign because of the calcification that develops. And there was calcification which was given along that lesion. So chronic history, two months ka, one side pe only not crossing the sutures along with the calcification that was given. All that is more in favor of cephal hematoma. Okay, all that is more in favor of cephal hematoma. So I would go with cephal hematoma in that case. The rest regress, uh, uh, you know, they regress faster as compared to cephal hematoma. So remember the double skull sign and that's the calcified cephal hematoma. Right. So thank you so much everyone for joining in. So these were the questions from radiology integrated with other subjects uh, that were asked. I, I hope you've got them uh, all right or majority of them right. And I wish you all the very best for the results. Hoping to get the results soon in like next 8 to 10 days. Though the official date is 31st March. But last year the results came really soon. Like in 10 days the results were out. So maybe we get back soon. So the sooner we get the better so that all of you get an uh, idea for, you know, how much uh, you need to prepare for INICT or, or whether you can take a chill pill. So uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining in. I hope you found this helpful for your upcoming exams as well. And yes, keep studying, uh, keep uh, revising and keep winning. And yes, soon I would be coming up with a strategy for INICT as well. All right. Thank you so much, everyone.